The fight between Dalton and the Mana Soldier raged on. Dalton deflected the Mana Soldier's attack and countered, but his attack was shallow and didn't inflict much damage on the Mana Soldier. As the Mana Soldier responded with a heavy strike using a flail weapon, Dalton dodged by leaping backward. He thinks he is fast and has enough intelligence to strategize, but his attack pattern is simple. There's some mana around his mace, which makes it dangerous. He is at a disadvantage since he can't use a mana blade. There must be a way, so let's try using the landform, as he looks toward the fort. Seeing Dalton from the fort, Homer noted that this wasn't easy for him at all, and asked Philip if he was sure they could just watch. They can still help them. Philip stated that they have been ordered to not interfere unless they ask. Stay put and wait. They rescued the hostages, which was the most important part. Let's believe in their young master and wait. But his talk was interrupted by Dalton calling him and Philip answered his call. He has a favor to ask of Philip. Dalton asked if he could tell his men to hold on to whatever surrounded them. He is going to use the fort now. It will shake a bit. Surprised, Philip wondered. How can the fort's going to shake? And immediately ordered everyone to get away from the wall. Get low and prepare for impact. Hold on to something so they don't fall off. Dalton thought he was fast. He understands why Raoul trusts his men so much. He thought to go again and try parrying this one, and then rushed forward, jumping into the mana soldier's shield to leap backward into the fort wall. As the mana soldier attacked the wall, causing it to shake, Philip ordered the knights to hold on. Using the wall, Dalton jumped into the air and landed a critical hit on the mana soldier, defeating it. He thinks that was risky. Thank God it worked. The wall was damaged a little. He hopes they will be okay with that. Surprisingly, Homer noted, first real combat experience, yet he's confident. Philip stated, yeah, almost to the point of arrogance. Homer remarked he's the sword master's grandson, Templeton's wolf after all. Seeing Dalton defeat the mana soldier, Raoul stated, they are done. It's about time they conclude their fight too. Standing here is getting annoying. Jack exclaimed that's what he wanted, but it won't end the way he thinks. He copied it pretty well, but a replica is only a replica. He shows Raoul the difference between them and rushes to attack while covering his sword in dark red mana. In response, Raoul easily blocked his sword attack, pushed him back, and then used the charged up attack that Jack barely evaded. Then he asked, how about now? The replica doesn't seem bad at all. Jack branded Raoul as an arrogant kid. However, Raoul thinks it's not bad. It's strong and easy to use. It's been a while since he has obtained a decent skill. At that moment, a red system window popped up showing an information error and explained the Regnator had detected prohibited traits. By the covenant with the Regnator, the skill Shadow Clipper will be discarded, which confused Raoul as he saw it. Raoul thinks, what does this mean? Prohibited traits? Is he saying he can't use the copied skill? Another window pops up showing information searching for an alternate skill. He thought he found a decent skill and now he is losing it without even having used it once. It seems like he can use it until an alternate skill is found. He has to end this fight before that. Whatever, he will use it as much as he can. He immediately rushes forward and launches an attack that he blocks. Then Jack asks, why is he being aggressive all of a sudden? Is he in a hurry now? He is pushed backward due to Raoul's attack, and he is about to counterattack. But Raoul uses the psychokinesis trait to fling a sword towards him, which narrowly misses. Jack asks, what is this? A sword flu? Where did it come from? To his surprise, multiple swords are floating in the air. He asks, how is this possible? But Raoul states, he didn't notice. Does he have tunnel vision? He said he wanted him to do his best, right? He will show him his best, and he uses the sword to attack him. Jake asks, what is this ridiculous trick? He called this his best? As he blocks them one after another. These attacks were disappointing to Jack. He asked Raoul to stop these tricks and face him. He doesn't have time to play with him. He offered Raoul to attack him for real. Raoul uses the psychokinesis trait on multiple swords to attack him from the front, and on two large axes to try to attack him from behind. Jake easily blocks the swords, but he struggles to block the axes. At that moment, Raoul uses more of his psychokinesis trait power to push Jack back toward him, and Raoul also covers his sword in golden mana to strike him from behind. 
Raul knew it. He can't break his power armor with improvised sword skills, but that doesn't mean there's no way to win. He uses psychokinesis power on his sword and also employs the Regnator power armor that covers his arm. He distracts him with that sword and closes the distance between them. He stated he was strong, but he talked too much. Time to shut the Empire Dog's mouth. Then he lands a powerful attack that causes an explosion on impact. As the dust settles, Jack is lying on the ground defeated. Raul thinks finally it's finished. He was a tough one. Considering how hard the fight was, he can expect some level ups. Then a system window pops up and he thinks, did it finally find an alternate skill? That was close. The window shows information. Alternate skill found. Acquired skill. Radiant Aura. Grade A+. Plus. Seeing that, he becomes surprised and notes, how did he get this skill? Radiant Aura is the top tire active skill used by the strongest Holy Knight. The overpowered skill that casts cleanse, blessing, and healing at the same time. He rarely saw this skill. Even when he was trash, he had that skill. He chuckled and stated, this is a jackpot. Raul thinks, ambushing a conquest team by hiding inside the gate, he didn't expect this. They were well prepared to. There must be a strategist behind this. He needs to be vigilant. His thoughts were interrupted by Dalton saying he went crazy there. He punched him in the face because he couldn't slash through his power armor. Raul replied it was nothing compared to him using the wall. Dalton stated whatever, they took care of the rest as well. This mission is a success, right? Raul appreciated his help. Dalton stated he came along to have fun, but he couldn't let his family name down. His grandpa would have killed him if he just sat here and watched. Raul thinks he also performed beyond his expectations. He can't believe this was his first real fight. If he becomes a part of the first nights, he will be massive. Noticing the rescue team, Philip immediately informed him. Jake laughs and calls Raul saying they are back. Pierce notes he told him not to call him that during a mission. Raul complimented them for their hard work. Everything is good. Jake chuckles and exclaims, there can't be a problem when he is here. Everything went flawlessly. Bernard reports there were no wounded, but there are a few casualties. They might need some help to move their bodies. Raul understands and plans to ask the guards for help. Meanwhile, while seeing Raul, Arson D. Carrington thinks he is iffy about it, but Raul is a master. Did he make this knighthood by himself? However, his thoughts were interrupted by Dalton asking, Isn't he Arson? He was one of the captured hostages. He didn't know that the Carrington Viscounty was a part of this. When Arson sees him, he wonders if Dalton is also part of Raoul's knight. This guy, how much influence does he have? Raoul stated the hostages had been rescued and they had gotten rid of the Empire's dogs. The fight is over and he thinks he has an insane skill too. What satisfying results. And he orders them, let's head back. The next day at Ashton County Mansion, Raoul asks, what did they do with the Empire soldiers that were held hostage? Philip replied, they secretly handed them over to President Gray as he ordered. Raoul inquires about their condition. Bernard replied, still the same. It seems like the Empire cast a spell on them that makes them lose their intelligence upon capture. It'll be hard to get any information out of them without President Gray's help. Raoul states President Gray might not have a solution for this either. He curses the Empire and then asks, what about their motive? Philip exclaims, they only know they disguise themselves as guards to get into the city. There will be a massive internal inspection due to this. They don't have any other information about them, so it'll be hard to figure out their motive. Raul wished they had an actual information organization, and he thinks the way they're operating is very precise and dangerous. They will need better information to prepare for the next attack. He will have to do something about it. And Raoul said they would leave that to the kingdom and President Gray. Tomorrow is the night's ceremony. Philip affirmed. Certainly. The capital is a bit chaotic right now, so the ceremony will be small and quiet, Raoul guessed. There will only be an actual review instead of a ceremony to show off. That's better for him. The ceremony still means a lot. He ordered both of them to make sure to prepare for it, and they exclaimed. Raoul continues with his thoughts. The ceremony will be a gathering of the kingdom's most renowned families and knights. It will be their first night's first time on an official stage. He has to make an impression of their first night's strength, past the kingdom to the empire. 
They will show them the majesty of the first night's regains over the entire continent. The following day, as they traversed the capital, Raoul and his first night's order drew astonished gazes. Citizens praised him as the guardian of Turium capital. Excited girls called out, Young Master Raoul, please glance this way. Raoul acknowledged them with a greeting. However, Josh seemed uncomfortable as the girls shouted, Red-haired knight, he looked splendid. Please look this way. Homer asked, he never experienced this as a mercenary, did he? Josh replied affirmatively. Homer reminded him to get used to it. As long as he's under the first knight's flag, he will always get such a welcome. Homer told Josh to answer them. He deserves it. Nervously, Josh greeted the girls, thinking he was glad he joined the first knights. The crowd cheered as they walked through the capital. Upon reaching their destination, Raoul commented, There are more here than he thought. Philip added, He thinks some free knights are here as well. Some knights began discussing among themselves. The knight on the left asked, Look over there. Aren't they the first knights? The knight on the right remarked, Yeah, they are the new knighthood who resolved the gate incident. The knight on the left stated, There are so many of them. Is every member of the knighthood here? The knight with the flight noted, What's so great about them? They are show-offs. The knight on the left remarked he heard there aren't many regular knights. Raoul thinks they seem to have attracted some attention. Nothing wrong with it. They are only here to show them what they are capable of. It's great that they are aware of them. A person approached Raoul and said, So this is how he meets the esteemed guardian of Turium. Raoul asks about him. The person stated, Nice to meet him, young master. He is the kingdom's financial director, Jerry D. Plank. He heard that he played a big part in the gate incident. Could they have a private chat? Raoul thinks, the kingdom's finance director, Jerry D. Plank, what is he planning? Plank continued by saying, he finally got to meet the capital's busiest hero. He has been wanting to meet him for a while, but he ve been busy. He heard that Raoul was participating in the ceremony, so he came here to meet Raoul. He felt like it'd be his only chance to meet him. Raoul think he came to see him on purpose. What does he want? The capital's guard captain said that most of the financial department was associated with Randall. He won't be any different and he came to see him personally. He isn't going to do something like that just to say hello. Is he trying to figure out what he is up to? He chuckled and stated, the capital's hero. That's an exaggeration, says Raoul to Viscount Plank. He did what any noble of the kingdom must do. Plank praises him and his knight's work saying they remain so humble. Raoul is as remarkable a person as he heard. Raoul will be a role model for the other knights. Raoul stated, all thanks to the financial department taking care of the kingdom's treasury. Knights can only function with the financial department's help. Plank replied that Raoul flattered him and thinks this guy, he's more clever than he thought. Raoul knows the financial department is hostile towards him considering his relationship with Randall. Yet Raoul is acting like this in front of him. He understands why everyone struggled with this kid. Raoul asked him that he does have one question to ask Plank. Viscount Plank inquired about it. Raoul said that he heard the financial department had banned the first night from entering the gate. He asked if Plank by any chance know anything about this? This sudden statement shocked Plank, and he thinks how can Raoul ask him that to his face? He's not trying to play a fool in front of him, or is he trying to say that he has evidence to consider the financial department his enemy? But he won't make it easy for Raoul. Plank stated, this is his first time hearing about that. That must be a false rumor. There's no reason for the financial department to be involved in such matters. Raoul replied, He is right then. Plank asked, Did he find anything about the Empire soldiers that had ambushed them at the gate? Raoul said, About that, they were well prepared for every possibility. Plank remarked, It must be just a taunt. Like the previous instance, they can't consider it as an actual invasion. Raoul stated, Really? But they ventured pretty deep, and they came so easily. It's almost like there's someone secretly talking to them from inside the kingdom. Then he chuckled and added, It's just his assumption. There's no way it's real, right? Plank remarked, as expected. He sees why people call him the protector of Turium. It was worth coming here to meet him. He will take his leave now. He hopes President Gray finds something useful from the captives. Raoul stated that's strange. It's top secret that President Gray is in charge of the captives. Then he guessed, 
The financial department knows a lot. Plank responded by saying, Of course, they are in charge of an important part of the kingdom. That was a fun conversation. He hoped to see Raul again in the future, and he thinks Raul Ashton is way beyond his expectations. Not bad. He will have fun destroying him. However, Raul thinks he chose the wrong person to mess with. Trash talking was the most important part of being a connected player. He is not sure how he's related to the Empire yet, but he'll be putting more pressure on them from now on. Let's try him. They won't back down. At the moment, someone from the crowd is spying on him. The person was faceless of the Information Guild. The guidance competition will begin soon. All participants, please gather at the lobby. Jake, with a smile, remarked, It's time. He has been waiting for this. Raul noted he seemed excited about this, even though he was complaining about its necessity not long ago. Jake replied, It feels different now that he is here in person. Raul stated, There's a deeper meaning to this ceremony for them than it seems. This will be their opportunity to show everyone who they are. All of you probably noticed, but they are already hostile towards them. That's all part of his plan, but something is missing. It's fear. Their goal is to make them fear them. Respect comes from fear. Make sure they engrave into their heads what the first knight is capable of. They all responded by saying, yes, sir. Raul turned to Philip and asked if he can take charges over from here. He will watch from the seat. Philip agreed on that. As they moved towards the lobby, Jake remarked, he swears to God. If any of them lose, they are going straight to hell. Philip added, that applies to him too. Don't underestimate them and focus. Raul think he doesn't have to worry about them anymore. Let's trust them and let them be. He has to take care of some other business, as he noticed Faceless leaving. Faceless immediately entered a narrow back alley street. But he became surprised as Raul stood in front of him, asking if he get everything he needed. He doesn't know why Faceless is hiding his presence in doing this, but if he has a question, he can always ask Raul. Faceless thinks he didn't sense him at all and asks, when did he find out? Raul replied, to be honest, he almost didn't. His presence was hard to find. As expected of the captain of the best information guild in the kingdom, Wing of Freedom, Detecting the presence of a faceless is not easy. He stated, let's stop playing hide and seek. Why don't they have some real talk now? Raul stated he would get straight to the point. He asked why the wing of freedom was following him. He would prefer to resolve this without conflict. He doesn't want to use force in public. Faceless asked if he knew what it meant for a member of the information guild to talk. Raul replied he does, but he doesn't think he has a choice here. For the guild master of Wing of Freedom to be out working by himself, that probably means there's a problem inside their guild. Faceless was quite surprised to see him already figured that out. Raul Ashton is as sharp as the rumors suggest. He took off his hoodie and remarked, There's no point in being stubborn here. He will talk. Raul is right. He is the guild master of Wing of Freedom. He is also known as Faceless. Raul exclaimed he liked how he understood his situation quickly. Now. Can he tell him why he was following him? Faceless remarked before he explained that he wanted to resolve the misunderstanding here. He has followed and investigated him, but that's not what he was here to do today. The man he just met, Jerry D. Plank, if he is right, that man is way more dangerous than he thinks. The scene changed in the arena. Jake skillfully outmaneuvers the knight, leaving the crowd in awe as they erupt into cheers. Incredible, Jake the undefeated knight, triumphs once more. How many victories in a row is that now? They're surpassing all the renowned knights. The defeated knight thought Jake was a monster. He wonders how Jake is moving so fast with that ginormous sword. Jake asked if he was not going to surrender. If the defeated knight wants to continue with bare hands, he is down for it. Then the knight admitted his loss, and the referee announced that victory went to the first knight. Pierce remarked he's growing egotistic again. He needs someone to humble him. But Josh was excited about Jake's win. Philip thinks that young master is late. He was the one who kept emphasizing how important the ceremony was. He wonders if something happens outside. Outside, Raoul asked, Viscount Plank. He's someone the Information Guild is wary of. Faceless remarked, Whatever Raoul may have imagined, he's beyond that. If he is right, they are a big threat to the entire kingdom. Raoul asked, What does he mean by they? Faceless explained, Imperial Hound, 
and asked if he had heard of that name before. Raoul stated that Cronin Empire's Special Intelligence Unit is a unit that's also called a myth since there is no information about them at all. Faceless remarked, he is right. It'll be easier to explain since he knows about them. Recently, many small guilds were raided one after another. However, since there was no evidence left at the site, the investigation went nowhere. This is known as a guild hunt between information guilds. Raoul asked if he suspected that the Imperial Hound did that. Faceless remarked he was not suspected, he was certain. They, the Wing of Freedom, became their target and faced them. Raoul asked about the relationship between Imperial Hound and Viscount Plank. Faceless remarked that this one is just an assumption. He thinks many in the kingdom are secretly cooperating with the Empire. Raoul asked if he thinks one of them is Financial Director Plank. Faceless exclaimed, Yes, there are many allegations against the Financial Department. Close connections with many families related to capital safety, indirect intervention when the gates appeared, and they're trying to ban the first knight from entering the gates. These actions are all hard to understand. Stopping the knighthood that did the most during the gate incident from entering the gates. Right after that, the party that went to investigate the gate was ambushed. Families that are close to the financial department didn't do anything about it. Moreover, ever since they found out that Imperial Hound was behind the ambush, the financial department has been trying to keep it quiet. Considering all this, it's safe to assume that if someone is cooperating with the Empire, that person is likely a part of the financial department. Raoul thought, as expected of the master of the information guild, he knows a lot. Faceless added, but they cannot be certain that the mole is in the financial department. It could be someone very random whom no one could have guessed. Maybe even the master of the first night, Raoul Ashton, could be that person too. Raoul stated, that's funny, and asked, why does he think that? Faceless explained, the first night came out of nowhere and showed remarkable performance in a short time. He bet everyone in the capital knows their name now. The pivotal moment came with the emergence of the gate. No one was ready for this unprecedented incident except the first knight. The first knight seemed to know everything, starting from the layout of the gate to information about the monsters and how to kill them. It's almost like they knew what was going to happen. Raoul thought, nice, he passed the test. And Faceless continued, wreaking havoc on purpose and stopping it to earn the public's fame is very risky but quite effective. Raoul gets why he is suspicious. He guessed it'd be better to show Faceless than try to explain everything one by one. Faceless asked about what Raoul was going to show him. Raoul proposes to him to join their knighthood. Then he will find out if he is holding the Empire's hand or its throat. Faceless asked if Raoul was asking him to join his knighthood. He thinks there's a misunderstanding here. Raoul is one of the suspects, so how can he join them? Raoul stated. Doubt him as much as he wants. He can decide for himself while he stands right next to him. Wing of Freedom is gone now, and he also happens to require some good informants. He thinks it's a win-win situation. Faceless looked towards the arena and asked if he was sure he could stay out for this long. He thought this ceremony was important for him and his knights. Raoul stated, for now, this is more important. Faceless remarked, his men are fighting to be recognized as official knights. He thinks he is being too negligent as their master. Raoul stated, it's because he trusts them. His being there doesn't matter because they will win anyway. Faceless added, this ceremony has renowned knights from all over the kingdom participating. He thinks he may be taking it a bit too easy. Raoul replied, he knows it won't be easy for them, but he trusts them. They fought alongside him multiple times. There's no way they'll lose. Faceless thinks he trusts his men that much. Then he exclaims, okay, he will cooperate with the first knight. He will consider officially joining the knighthood after some time. Raoul stated, he made the right choice. Faceless put the hoodie on and remarked, then he will see him again next time. He doesn't like to stay in one place for too long. Raoul said he will be waiting for him. Faceless replied, just call him Kane, and then addressed Raoul as his master, and he left. Raoul thought things went well. He needed a skilled informant, for which he ended up getting the master of Wing of Freedom on his side. He hoped they understood his absence since he had a little more important thing to do, but he couldn't be a no-show throughout the ceremony. Let's see how they're doing in the arena. Randall's knight wins against another knight, and people begin talking excitedly about Randall's victory. 
They won with the shooting star move once more, they're hyped up about Randall's victory, and see the ceremony as a showdown between Randall and the first knight. Meanwhile, Jake asked why they were so aggressive. It is looking too much. Philip remarked that it is because of themselves. They are trying to make a good impression. Pierce asked, only they and Randall are left undefeated. They haven't gone up against Randall yet. He wonders if Randall's are avoiding them on purpose. Homer remarked, probably not. The opponents are paired randomly. Jake stated that Randall was already aggressive enough. They'll fight for real against them. He then asked Josh how he was feeling. Jake asked if Josh could win against them. At that moment, Raul came and stated, he has to. It'll be a problem if he can't. Josh exclaimed, he is here. Raul said that he was the opponent. Randall's so-called genius, the tenth son, Roy D. Randall. It won't be easy, but it's still winnable. They are probably happy right now. Their first opponent is a newbie who used to be a peasant. Prove them wrong with his skill. Josh confidently said that he would come victorious, and then moved forward. Homer asked if he was sure about this. Randall will try to kill him. Raul told him not to worry. He won't lose even if he wants to. Roy and Josh stood face to face, ready to confront each other, while the crowd discussed the match. Roy chuckled and remarked he thought he was finally going up against the first knight. He didn't know he did have to fight against some peasant. He has lost interest already. He shut him down in one move and then called Josh a kid. Meanwhile, Josh thought he was a noble from one of the five renowned families. He'll be stronger than any enemy he has ever fought against, but he can't give up. He is no longer a peasant or a mercenary. He is one of the first knights. He can't lose his master and the rest of the first knights. With determination, he took a defensive stance. Roy rushed forward and launched a sword attack that Josh blocked successfully. Observing Josh's skill, Roy remarked he guesses he can track his sword. He rushes towards Josh again, exclaiming, How about this? However, Josh easily blocks this attack as well. Angered by Josh's defense, he throws numerous sword attacks, but Josh blocks each one with ease. Frustrated, Roy exclaims, He is a damn peasant. Once more, he charges forward to attack, but Josh thrusts his leg forward, catching Roy's leg and causing him to fall to the ground. Roy grew even angrier, but Josh wondered if this was all he had. He can anticipate every move Roy makes. He doesn't even feel threatened. If that's all he has, he can win. The spectators erupted in shouts, with one exclaiming if everyone saw that. The Randall kid can't do anything. Another questioned if they were sure Josh was a mercenary before. He's experienced. Roy was angry and shouted how he, a peasant, dared to embarrass him. Josh retorted, embarrassed. He didn't think he had to care about Roy's feelings right now. He questioned if Roy wanted him to match his mood or something. Roy, growing increasingly frustrated, asked if he knew who he was. Josh responded firmly, that's weird. He had heard that every knight participating in this ceremony was going to be treated equally. This might be a mock battle, but it's still quite real. There's no time for us to care about our opponents or show manners. Arguing over being a noble or a peasant doesn't make sense in the first place. There's only the stronger and the weaker here. As Roy rushed forward in anger, shouting, you bastard, and told Josh to shut up, Josh effortlessly blocked his attack. Meanwhile. Jake commented that he thought he was supposed to be a rookie, but he's nothing. Philip replied negatively and said that he is considered highly skilled by Randall. Raul added the reality that Josh is just overwhelmingly stronger than him, and that's it. Homer remarked that he knew Josh was talented, but this was way beyond what he expected. Hearing this, Raul explained that Randall probably thought he could overpower him by going hard from the beginning. That was a mistake. Josh has already successfully returned from a gate conquest. There's not a single chance of Josh losing this. Josh swung his sword for the first time in the match, catching Roy off guard. Roy struggled to block it, and the force of the blow pushed him back. Undeterred, Josh rushed forward, declaring blocking isn't fun anymore. Let's do this for real now, calling Roy Mr. Noble. As Josh attacked again, Roy managed to block the strike. Then Josh attempted to land a punch but Roy quickly jumped backward to evade his fist. Roy cursed Josh for using a fist in the show where one should show their sword skill. Then he asked Josh if he thought this was some sort of street fight. 
Josh and Roy swung their swords at each other, each meeting their match. Josh asked him what he thought real combat was. There's no honor in real combat. Roy was the one who tried to kill him. Then he told Roy to surrender if he was scared. But Roy shouted back. He promised to make Josh shut his mouth. He launched an attack that Josh successfully blocked. The crowd became excited and started shouting. There he is. Randall's son isn't that bad after all. Now this is getting fun. Philip remarked, he's persistent, unlike other Randalls. Raul stated that's probably why he's known as a rookie. However, persistence isn't enough to beat Josh. In the meantime, Josh seized Roy by the neck and delivered a headbutt, causing Roy to stagger backward. Roy asked about that. Josh replied that sometimes he has to use his head in real combat. Roy cursed him saying he was from the streets. He uses dirty tricks. This isn't for mercenaries like him, but he will have to use this. Since Josh has insulted him so much, he has no reason to hide. Josh thought, there it is, Randall's shooting star. A lot of renowned knights of the kingdom lost to that skill. He wonders if he can block it. Roy rushed forward, exclaiming, he will obliterate Josh. Think of it as an honor to die by a Randall sword. Josh thought it was different. It is fast and threatening. But compared to what he has experienced during his time with the first knight, this is nothing. Josh surged forward, landing a decisive sword strike, defeating Roy. The crowd was in surprise while Raul stood confidently wearing a smile. Josh shouts saying, peasant this, peasant that. He talked too much. He should have learned how to fight rather than how to talk. It doesn't matter if he is noble or a peasant. In real combat, strength matters. The referee then announced that victory goes to the first knight. As Josh struck a victory pose, the audience erupted in cheers, exclaiming that the first knight had won and defeated Randall's shooting star. They expressed amazement at his performance, noting that Randall had lost to a newcomer mercenary. They proclaimed the first knight as the best knighthood in the ceremony. The black-haired boy expressed astonishment at the new knighthood's impressive strength. The brown-haired boy acknowledged that the rumors were true, believing the knighthood's master to be Ashton's son, and mentioned his intention to write Ashton a congratulatory letter. The black-haired boy added that he would also search for other Ashton in the capital. Hudson D. Randall, Count of Randall County and head of the family, angrily thought about how his knight lost to a mercenary despite being allowed to use lethal force. He was frustrated that even extreme measures to disable his opponent were ineffective. He questioned if Raul Ashton had truly gathered such powerful people without his family's assistance. Realizing the urgency of the situation, he resolved to take swift action. Hudson told his knight captain there was nothing more to see and instructed him to leave. When the knight captain questioned the sudden departure, Hudson ordered him to leave the knights to someone else and return, taking only a few followers. The knight captain then asked where Hudson was going, and Hudson replied that he needed to visit the financial department to see Plank. After they left, the duel continued. This time, an expert knight advanced to face Philip in combat. The knight initiated an aggressive attack, only to have Philip skillfully block it, leaving the knight visibly stunned. Sweating profusely from the unexpected turn, the knight's distraction allowed Philip to maneuver behind him. With a swift leap, Philip launched a decisive sword strike from the air. However, at the last moment, just before his blade would have connected, Philip skillfully halted his attack. The knight, taken aback by Philip's rapid movements, showed signs of confusion. Despite this, Philip complimented the knight, acknowledging the intensity and quality of their fight by saying, it was a nice fight. Acknowledging defeat, the knight conceded, and the referee declared the first knight the victor. The crowd erupted in cheers, celebrating the first knight's continued winning streak. Jake commented that Philip's victory seemed effortless for him. Meanwhile, Josh expressed his admiration for Philip's win. Another observer remarked that Philip had decisively defeated a fellow advanced expert, emphasizing the dominance displayed in the match. A person with reddish-brown hair noted that Philip's performance confirmed that he was the main knighthood of the ceremony. Meanwhile, a bold individual named Jaden D. Ashton, Viscount of the Jaden Viscounty, observed the scene from a distance and questioned if it was the first knight, mentioning the knighthood Raoul formed. The observer recognized familiar faces among them, turning to Titus for insights. The discussion shifted to Raoul's character. 
Titus described Raoul as someone who had been calm and composed from a young age. He speculated that Raoul had likely matured further since the gate incident. Jaden remarked on the Ashton family's transformation, noting their previous satisfaction with rural swordplay. However, he was impressed by their recent developments. Meanwhile, Medeiros, commander of the kingdom's holy knights, expressed his interest in the first knights and their knighthood. He mentioned hearing from the capital that they were considered the finest in the kingdom, attributing this reputation to their exceptional performance. Medeiros likened their prowess to that seen in pre-war ceremonies. Sitting beside Medeiros was Carson, commander of the Royal Guards and president of the Reuben Kingdom Knights Association. Carson questioned the validity of crowning the best knighthood through a ceremony where prominent families like Templeton, Greer, and Ashton's Golden Bear did not participate. He expressed skepticism about the ceremony's ability to truly determine the kingdom's finest knights under these circumstances. Medeiros responded, acknowledging Carson's point but also highlighting the surprise that a new knighthood had managed to defeat Randall, one of the five renowned warrior families. Then he talked to President Gray, seeking his opinion on the matter. Carson interjected with an intriguing detail, mentioning that he had heard the master of the first knight was a student at the academy. Gray replied that they had met a few times before. Carson inquired about Raoul Ashton's character, prompting Gray to humorously request permission to pose his question first. Gray then asked Carson and Medeiros if they believed the kingdom was currently in peace. In response, Carson conveyed his belief that there are no peaceful times for knights, emphasizing the constant need for vigilance and readiness against potential threats. Gray acknowledged Carson's perspective and admitted his limited knowledge of Raoul. He refrained from making definitive statements about the kingdom's safety compared to Carson and Medeiros, but speculated that Raoul might emerge as a savior should an evil force threaten the kingdom in the future. However, he emphasized that these were simply his thoughts and not certainties. Medeiros chuckled at Gray's praise for Raoul, jokingly suggesting that Raoul must be Gray's favorite student given the admiration expressed. Carson, however, maintained a serious tone and expressed his desire to test Raoul himself. He emphasized that true greatness in a knight isn't defined solely by honor or reputation but by strength and demonstrated ability. Carson was determined to ascertain whether Raoul's reputation was grounded in reality or merely an illusion, indicating his intent to evaluate Raoul's true medal firsthand. A little later, amidst the anticipation of the kingdom's official knight induction ceremony, a knight announced the commencement. He called for Sir Raoul Ashton, the representative and master of the first knight, to step forward. The crowd erupted in cheers, expressing their admiration for the young master. Before proceeding, the knight turned to Carson and asked if they should begin. However, Carson paused and addressed Raoul directly. He expressed a request to Raoul, asking him to humor him before they officially started the ceremony. Raoul contemplated Carson's words carefully, reflecting on the current president of the Knights Association's intentions. Carson acknowledged the exceptional performance displayed by the first knight during the ceremony, but expressed disappointment that only one of the esteemed warrior families had participated. He continued, stating that as the president of the Knights Association, he desired to personally gauge the strength of the first knight. Carson then turned to Raoul directly seeking his opinion and asking if he agreed with the assessment. Raoul pondered the significance of Carson's challenge, recognizing the immense reputation and skill of Viscount Carson. Carson was the president of the Reuben Kingdom's Knight Association, a captain of the Royal Knights, and a beginner swordmaster. The gap between a swordmaster and a high expert was vast, making Carson the strongest opponent Raoul had ever faced. As Raoul weighed his options, Carson addressed him again. Noting Raoul's hesitation, he expressed surprise, expecting the master of the first knight to accept the challenge without delay. Raoul knew that accepting Carson's request would test his limits and possibly redefine his standing as a knight. Pierce turned to Philip and asked, What's going on? Why he is trying to fight their master? Philip responded that Carson wanted to test them for himself. According to him, this one is a lot different from before. Their young master can't beat a sword master yet, but if he avoids Carson here, the work we did to bolster our reputation will amount to nothing at all. An unavoidable fight with no chance of winning, what their young master will do. After a brief moment of contemplation, 
Raoul agreed, saying, sure. This response confused Carson. Raoul clarified, a duel with the respected president of the Knight Association, he can't miss out on such an honor. He wishes to learn a lot from the president. Both Raoul and Carson unsheathed their swords, preparing for the fight. Carson remarked, since many people are watching, this duel should do justice to the name of the Knights of the Reuben Kingdom. Raoul respectfully acknowledged the president, saying, of course, and thanked this opportunity. The audience erupted in excitement, shouting, wow, president versus Sir Raoul. This is amazing. This is the actual highlight of this ceremony. Meanwhile, Josh asked Philip about what was happening. This duel wasn't planned. Philip replied that it shouldn't happen, not in a normal ceremony at least. Pierce added, however, this ceremony has undergone significant changes in both schedule and scale, which means there's no point in sticking to the previous standards. Jack commented, that just means they have to prove themselves twice. Homer noted that President Carson is a strict person, so he wants to be certain. Philip concluded that Master must have accepted the duel because he's got something. They just have to trust his judgment. Gray laughed and remarked that he thought he put Raul in an awkward position by talking too much. Medeiros asked what is awkward about that and added that he think this is better for Raul. A duel with the president of the Knight Association isn't something he can experience anywhere. I've known Sir Carson for a long time, but it's been a while since I last saw him like this, with such enthusiasm. Raul then asked if they should begin and rushed towards Carson, who took a defensive stance. Raul launched a forceful attack with his sword, which Carson blocked. Raul leaped into the air and attacked again with more force, and Carson blocked this attack with some effort. Carson then swung his sword at Raul for the first time, and Raul blocked it with his sword. Raul thought he couldn't give Carson any space. He will counterattack if I stop for even a split second. I have to keep up. To his surprise, Carson's sword was about to hit him, but Raul immediately swung his sword to deflect Carson's strike. Raul realized that was close. Carson is one step faster than him. He tried taking control of the duel by striking over and over, but Carson came at him with an even faster move. Is this what a sword master is capable of? He thought. I can't give up already. Determined, Raul launched one attack after another, which Carson blocked. Carson then counterattacked with sharper and more forceful strikes. The audience stood up from their seats, shouting, This is another level. They can't even tell what's going on because they're so fast. Josh exclaimed while cursing. He cannot imagine a sword master can be this powerful. Raoul thought, as expected, Carson is strong. He can't find any gaps. He can only trade blows with him. Carson then complimented Raoul and said he had seen Raoul's sword skill now. However, there's something more important than that. A cube of deep blue hue, surrounded by swirling black energy, appeared above Carson's left hand. He continued, if Raoul is going to lead the new generation, he will need more than just sword skill. Carson asked Raoul if he was ready, prompting Raoul to notice a strange energy emanating from a cube artifact. Raoul questioned Carson's intentions with the artifact. Medeiros questioned why Carson was using the artifact. Gray expressed concern about the artifact's abnormal behavior. Medeiros identified it as a hybrid core, a significant artifact of the High Holy Knights designed to detect dark mana, primarily used by the kingdom's soldiers. Originally intended to uncover spies, during the ceremony its deployment was canceled due to stability concerns. Carson's unexpected use of the artifact raised eyebrows, with Medeiros questioning the extent of Carson's actions. In the arena, Carson continued, urging him not to be suspicious despite the first knight's contributions to the kingdom. Carson emphasized his need for certainty and requested Raoul's cooperation. He then activated the hybrid core, causing dark mana to emanate from it and envelop Raoul. Meanwhile, at the Reuben Kingdom's Department of the Interior, Plank expressed surprise at Count Randall's presence, noting rumors of his knight's participation in the ceremony. Hudson confronted Plank, questioning his apparent lack of concern for the ceremony's importance. He couldn't understand why Plank remained relaxed and suggested that Plank might be underestimating the event's significance. Plank responded by acknowledging the first knight's impressive performance during the ceremony, implying that he was aware of its impact. Hudson continued, expressing certainty that the first knights would become obstacles, 
emphasizing that it was Planck's responsibility to prevent such interference. Planck reassured Hudson, dismissing the potential challenges as minor issues that wouldn't affect their larger plans. Hudson challenged Planck's dismissal of the Ashton kids as a small problem. Planck clarified that while Ashton County posed a threat if united against them, he viewed Raoul individually, without the support of his county, as manageable. Hudson fell silent. Then he elaborated on Raoul's growing influence and popularity within the kingdom, suggesting that the first knight could potentially become a more significant threat than even the Golden Bear Knights. He pressed Planck on whether he still considered them a minor concern. The first knight was led by a relatively inexperienced knight who was indeed causing trouble for their plans. He expressed confidence that Raoul Ashton was unaware of the true conflict brewing, implying that Raoul might not yet comprehend the scale of the impending conflict. In the arena, a dramatic scene unfolded as black mana engulfed the surroundings, causing concern among the audience, who questioned the safety of the duel. The first knight order anxiously watched over their master Raoul. Meanwhile, Carson observed the increasing intensity of the divine power being unleashed, bewildered by its unexpected strength. Raoul, undeterred by the chaos, reflected on the unending vigilance and readiness required of a knight, influenced by the teachings instilled by the academy's president. Despite the turmoil, Raoul questioned whether he should still commit to the duel, embodying the dedication expected of a knight sworn to protect the kingdom. Carson was astonished when Raoul not only passed the dark mana test of the hybrid core, but also utilized the divine power emanating from it. Carson speculated whether Raoul possessed a higher caliber of divine power than expected for someone of his rank. Subsequently, a sight that shocked Carson, Gray, and the assembled crowd, Raoul then concentrated the gathered divine energy into his arm and unleashed a powerful blast toward the sky. Witnessing these displays of prowess, Carson and others remained in stunned silence. Raoul, confident in his abilities, sought confirmation, addressing the president directly and asking if he had proven himself. Amid the commotion at the arena, a person with red hair enthusiastically shouted that Master Raoul was God's apostle, pointing out the awe-inspiring manifestation of the wings of light. The crowd caught up in the fervor, echoed this sentiment, proclaiming Raoul to be the chosen apostle capable of controlling divine power. They revered the first knights as God's knights, guardians of Turium. Amidst the chants and declarations, Jaden turned around and remarked that they had seen enough. Titus expressed surprise at Jaden's readiness to leave so soon. Jaden explained that he now understood why Randall was cautious of Raoul despite his young age. He reflected on the unexpected emergence of such a formidable figure from their lineage and anticipated the unfolding events with excitement. Shortly thereafter, a knight proclaimed the announcement, Raoul Ashton as the leader of the Order of Knights, the first knight, and the head of the knight order. The audience erupted in cheers. Meanwhile, Raoul knelt before Carson, positioning himself for the solemn ceremony. Carson initiated the oath-taking ritual by placing his blade on Raoul's shoulder, representing the Knights Association of the Reuben Kingdom. Carson posed the question, asking Raoul, now the master of the first knight, if he swore allegiance to the kingdom and its ruler, the king. Raoul, with unwavering determination, solemnly declared he swore. Carson asked Raoul if he and his knights pledged to protect the royal family and the kingdom's people with their lives and to take the lead in eliminating any threats to the kingdom. Raoul responded with a resolute, I swear. Carson then inquired if Raoul vowed to always train himself with humility and diligence and to follow the code of chivalry while upholding the honor of the kingdom's knights. Again, Raoul affirmed with conviction, saying, I swear. Continuing the oath, Carson emphasized that Raoul and his knights must embody strength, honor, and loyalty, ensuring the kingdom's prosperity, upholding the knight's honor, and maintaining justice. Carson officially recognized Raoul and his knights as integral knights of the great Reuben kingdom. After the ceremony concluded, Medeiros approached Carson and inquired about his feelings regarding Raoul Ashton. Carson initially feigned ignorance, prompting Medeiros to clarify that he was asking about Carson's impressions after dueling against Raoul. Carson, somewhat dismissively, asked if Medeiros had not witnessed the duel noting that Raoul displayed all the qualities expected of a knight of the kingdom. 
However, Medeiros persisted, indicating that he wasn't interested in Carson's assessment of Raul's combat skills. Carson then questioned what it was that Medeiros wanted to know. He saw Raul Ashton during the duel, and after a moment of silence, Carson revealed his motives behind testing Raul Ashton. He explained that he wanted to understand President Gray's statement's meaning, which had troubled him. Carson outlined three particular points that had unsettled him. First, Gray's warning about an impending threat to the kingdom. Second, Gray's suggestion that Raul Ashton might be the savior of all. And third, the fact that these statements came from President Gray himself. Carson questioned Medeiros about whether President Gray had ever mentioned such concerns about a threat to the kingdom or singled out someone as a potential savior. He mentioned that while Gray attributed these remarks to personal thoughts, Carson couldn't dismiss them lightly as a kingdom knight without seeking deeper understanding and clarity. Asking if Carson believed President Gray, stating that Gray had indeed sensed an imminent threat that necessitated a savior. Medeiros then questioned Carson further, asking if he saw Raul Ashton in the same light as President Gray did now. Carson admitted uncertainty but asserted one certainty. If Raul remained loyal to their cause, he could potentially fulfill the role of the kingdom's savior. However, should Raul turn against them, Carson warned that he could become their worst nightmare. Medeiros brought up Raul's successful passing of the hybrid core test, but Carson reminded him that the test only verified the use of dark mana, not allegiance or true intentions. Carson emphasized the ambiguity surrounding Raul's relentless actions, suggesting it was prudent to approach him with caution until his true motivations became clearer. Medeiros reflected on Carson's character, noting how unchanged and steadfast he had remained over the years. At the Ashton County mansion the next day, the first knights were engaged in training. Josh sparred with Jake, rushing in with a vigorous attack. However, Jake effortlessly countered Josh's assault with a single move, sending Josh crashing to the ground. Frustrated, Josh questioned Jake about his ability to consistently block his attacks. Jake explained that while Josh's attacks were swift and forceful, they were predictable and lacked subtlety. He pointed out that while such tactics might be effective against some opponents, they wouldn't suffice against adversaries who had real combat experience. Jake advised Josh to adapt his fighting style according to different types of opponents, emphasizing the need to recognize and adjust to the strengths and weaknesses of each adversary. Acknowledging Jake's advice, Josh accepted the need to modify his approach in combat. Jake remarked to Josh that many recruits had joined after witnessing the ceremony, largely inspired by Josh's performance. Flustered, Josh asked if they could join after watching him. He emphasized that Josh now bore a responsibility to serve as a role model for these recruits. Jake expressed concern that this situation would likely lead to significant trouble. Josh sought clarification, asking Jake to explain what he meant by his ominous statement. Meanwhile, Raul observed the exchange between Josh and Jake from his window, sighing at the situation unfolding. At that moment, Bernard approached Raul, informing him that the initiation test for the recruits he had mentioned earlier was all prepared and ready to commence. Raul expressed gratitude to Bernard for preparing the initiation test, noting that their efforts during this ceremony had proven fruitful. He anticipated that their previously quiet knighthood would now become bustling with recruits. Curious about Raoul's sudden push for expansion, Bernard questioned whether there was a specific reason for the urgency. Raoul pondered Bernard's concern and then questioned whether Bernard truly believed the kingdom was currently peaceful. Bernard sought clarification, prompting Raoul to acknowledge that while minor issues might occur, the kingdom was currently enjoying a period of peace as it always had. However, Raoul ominously predicted that this peace would soon be shattered by an incident five days hence. He stressed the urgency of their preparations, emphasizing their responsibility to prevent the impending crisis and maintain peace. Then the scene shifts to a conversation between Gerald D. Rubin, the sixth prince of the Rubin kingdom, and Carson. Gerald thanked Carson for overseeing the ceremony on behalf of the royal family. Carson humbly responded that he had simply carried out his duty. Gerald explained that due to recent incidents at the gate, the royal family couldn't participate in events and hoped Carson understood their position. Carson acknowledged the uncertain times and stressed the importance of prioritizing the safety of the royal family, a sentiment he believed all knights shared. 
Gerald expressed his gratitude and mentioned hearing that a new knighthood had performed exceptionally well at the ceremony, specifically inquiring about the first knight. Carson confirmed that only one warrior family had participated. The first knight remained undefeated, distinguishing himself in the competition. Gerald expressed admiration for Raoul Ashton, that he also sensed something from him when he saw him at the academy, and that recalling him and his knights. They had stood at the forefront during the appearance of the gates in the capital. They bravely protected the city and even defeated Empire scouts inside one of the gates, impressed by their valor and dedication. Gerald suggested that they deserved recognition from the royal family, possibly even a medal. He mentioned that currently they are stationed at the gates vigilantly watching to prevent any monsters from escaping and his intention to visit them personally to offer his appreciation and rewards and asked for Carson's suggestion. Carson, however, regretfully informed Gerald that the first knight was not permitted to enter any of the gates in the capital. Gerald was incredulous upon hearing that the knighthood responsible for defending the city during the gate incident was barred from entering any of the gates in the capital. He questioned who had issued such an order. Carson explained that the restriction was imposed by Randall, who managed the capital's defenses. The rationale given was to optimize their forces effectively. Carson clarified that they were only allowed entry into one specific gate where Empire scouts were located due to the presence of hostages. Gerald expressed frustration, emphasizing that this wasn't the time for internal conflicts among noble families. Determined to address the issue directly, he declared his intention to meet with Count Randall personally to resolve the matter and ensure that the knighthood received the recognition and access they deserved. Inside one of the gates, a system window displayed information about the monsters in that gate, including an armored boar at level 55, rank D, with mutated maulers and arm traits. Meanwhile, Raoul entered the gate and swiftly defeated several armored boars near the entrance. Reflecting on the situation, Raoul noted the abundance of armored boars inside the gate and realized the potential chaos that would ensue in the capital if these creatures escaped. Determined to prevent disaster, Raoul resolved to handle the threat within the gate. However, as he strategized, the armored boars regrouped and launched a coordinated attack from all directions inside the gate. After Raoul had encountered the armored boars and faced their coordinated attack, members of the first knight arrived to assist. Philip, Josh, Pierce, and Jake swiftly engaged the armored boars, joining forces to defeat the creatures that had threatened Raoul. Assessing the situation, Philip remarked that dealing with the armored boars would take considerable time. Jake emphasized that they were only at the entrance of the gate and that this was just the beginning of their task. Pierce stressed the importance of halting the armored boars within the gate to prevent them from escaping into the capital. Josh expressed concern about their ability to achieve this daunting task. In response, Raoul assured them not to worry, stating that they were not the central figures in this gate scenario. As he said that, Alchemist Nakia arrived on the scene, apologizing for her tardiness due to the time needed to brew a potion. Raoul reassured her, emphasizing her crucial role in the mission. Encouraged by Raoul's words, Nakia unleashed her alchemical power, creating a massive explosion. The brightness of the explosion surprised Josh, while Jake marveled at its display, questioning if it was indeed magic. Philip recognized that what they witnessed was not just ordinary magic, but a potent blend of alchemy and magic. While battling inside the gate, Nakia unleashed her alchemical magic once more, blasting the monsters with powerful force. Observing Nika's prowess, Raoul reflected on her resilience, noting that despite the recent ordeal with her sister, she hadn't weakened. In fact, her abilities had surpassed his expectations. Impressed by Nika's display of alchemy and magic, Raoul acknowledged the significant boost she brought to their forces. After finishing the monsters, she turned to his comrades, asking was too much, but they were all struck by Nika's abilities. Philip praised Nika's use of potions to amplify mana as brilliant, emphasizing its effectiveness in combat. Raoul agreed, recognizing Nakia as a formidable asset and the strongest wild card they possessed. He acknowledged that their current success was largely due to Nika's contributions, but reminded everyone that they still faced the challenge of defeating the guardian of a C-rank gate. After some time, Gerald D. Rubin, the sixth prince of the Rubin kingdom, visited Randall County. Upon his arrival, Hudson D. Randall, 
the Count of Randall, greeted him with an apology, explaining that he had not been informed of the prince's visit in advance and therefore could not prepare accordingly. Prince Gerald reassured Count Randall that apologizing was unnecessary, as he did not expect any special preparations for his visit. The Count expressed his gratitude for the prince's understanding. The prince then shifted the conversation to a pressing matter, stating his desire to discuss it immediately despite his wish for a more relaxed conversation. He mentioned that he had heard about a ban on gate entry requested by the Randall family, specifically affecting the first night, and asked for clarification on the situation. Count Randall explained that the gate entry ban was a strategic decision to efficiently manage the gates and the capital. He clarified that this measure was taken in consultation with the capital guard and was not exclusive to the first night, but applied to all knighthoods. Prince Gerald D. Rubin acknowledged Count Randall's dedication to the capital's security, but emphasized the critical nature of the current situation, where every soldier's contribution is vital. He declared that the gate entry ban would be completely lifted allowing all knighthoods and mercenary groups to defend the capital. Gerald assured that he would personally inform the capital guard commander and instructed Count Randall to leave gate control to the capital guard. Count Randall complied with the prince's orders. However, as Prince Gerald departed, Count Randall's frustration and anger surfaced. He felt disrespected by the sixth prince and internally fumed, vowing that Prince Gerald, the first knight, and others would soon regret their actions. Meanwhile, the first knight's party, having entered the gate, was engaged in combat with monsters. Jake expressed frustration over the narrow terrain, hindering his ability to wield his sword freely, while Philip noted that at least they couldn't be surrounded. Pierce encouraged his team to stay focused, reminding them that the terrain would remain challenging for a while. Jake commented on how well Nakia was managing in the narrow space despite the challenging terrain. As Nakia stumbled, Josh quickly caught her advising her to be careful. Nakia thanked him, and Josh offered his help whenever needed. Observing this, Jake remarked that Josh needed to get himself together. Raul noted the difficulty of traversing the gate's terrain, which consumed a lot of stamina. He mentioned that he was able to enter the gate due to his favor with the capital guard, but since the operation was unofficial, he couldn't bring many members. He acknowledged Nakia's valuable contribution to their forces, but worried that everyone would be exhausted before the raid even began. Raul was uncertain about the usefulness of taking a break due to the terrain. At that moment, Nakia suggested taking a short break to help everyone recover. Philip asked for clarification on how she intended to help them recover. Nakia revealed that she had brought a stamina recovery potion she made, explaining that while it might not be as effective as those from the monastery, it would still be beneficial. She handed the potion to Jake, who, before she could stop him, drank the entire bottle in one go. Jake immediately felt an overwhelming surge of power. Nakia explained that the potion was concentrated and could have been shared among them. Fortunately, she had brought an extra bottle. Pierce remarked that Jake often acted impulsively due to his muscular, less thoughtful nature. Raul was impressed that Nakia had made a potion typically requiring divine power from a certified priest using only alchemy. He realized that bringing Nakia along had been a wise choice, as they could now move forward without concerns. With their energy restored, Raul suggested they continue their mission. Jake enthusiastically agreed, ready to face any guardian or challenge ahead. Philip asked Nakia if she had a potion to silence someone. Nakia replied that she did not have such a potion. Meanwhile, a dungeon gate guardian, the lion-maned bowman, champion level 77, rank B, with traits such as being armed, having deformed molars, and a mane, observed the group from a distance. The scene shifted to one of the Reuben Kingdom's prisons. Vice President Gray approached the guards on duty, thanked them for their hard work, and requested to interrogate the prisoner alone. The guards complied and left. Gray then approached the cell holding an imperial hound and questioned the prisoner's loyalty to the empire. The imperial hound mocked Gray, suggesting his acting was poor, and challenged him to reveal his true self. Gray's appearance began to change, revealing himself to be Kane, the faceless master of the information guild. Acknowledging the imperial hound's skills, Kane admitted understanding why his guild had crumbled before them and prepared to start the interrogation. The Imperial Hound mocked Kane, dismissing his intention to conduct an interview and calling it a farce. He taunted Kane, 
suggesting that interrogation through threats or torture wouldn't yield any useful information. Kane sighed, acknowledging that while those methods might be tempting, he couldn't use them. He explained that he was no longer part of the Information Guild Wing of Freedom but had joined the first night, which followed strict rules against torture. The Imperial Hound laughed at the irony, ridiculing Kane for becoming the dog of a nobleman. Playing on Kane, he sarcastically encouraged him to try extracting information using the first night's methods, doubting their effectiveness, and challenging him to follow through. Kane smiled and explained his approach, highlighting that first nights do not use threats, torture, or coercion during interrogations. Instead, they use artifacts. He revealed an artifact that paralyzes the mind, compelling the subject to divulge information. With slight adjustments, it can also erase memories of the past few hours, ensuring the subject forgets the interrogation and their betrayal. Kane proposed this method as fair, as he would obtain the information without the Imperial Hound feeling guilty about betraying the Empire. He then asked the Imperial Hound about their final goal. The scene then shifted back to the gate, where Jake expressed frustration upon encountering a dungeon immediately after barely passing through the George. Confused by the gate's challenges, Nakia sought clarification from R. Raoul explained that the dungeon had formed from the mana of the gate, and it appeared to still be in the process of forming. He warned that if the gate's rank rose to C, the terrain itself would undergo significant changes. Therefore, they needed to act swiftly. If they didn't defeat the Guardian soon, it could pose a serious threat. Josh raised concerns about the dungeon potentially engulfing the gate's terrain, which could lead to monsters of a much higher level pouring into the capital. Jake, understanding the urgency of the situation, urged Raoul to proceed quickly, addressing him as master. Raoul, however, found the timing and circumstances suspicious. He noted that such a challenging gate had appeared shortly before that incident. He reflected that gates of rank C or higher typically required significant time to conquer, and that this dungeon seemed particularly formidable. He suspected that someone might be deliberately trying to tie down their knighthood to this gate, possibly as a distraction or trap. As Raoul contemplated the suspicious timing of the gate's appearance, Jake interrupted his thoughts, addressing him as master and asking if there was a problem. Raoul brushed it off, reassuring the group to take their time to scout the area and prepare thoroughly before entering. He emphasized the uncertainty of the unfolding situation and the need for ample preparation. All the members acknowledged Raoul's instructions, expressing their understanding. Raoul questioned himself, wondering if he was overthinking things. Despite his suspicions, he acknowledged that they couldn't leave the gate and decided to focus on breaking through it as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, from a distance, two figures observed them who were Imperial Hounds. As the first knights entered the dungeon, Josh held on to the magic lamp while Jake, remarking on the dungeon's size and eerie silence, speculated it might be due to its incomplete state. Pierce cautioned against dropping their guard, sensing a latent danger despite the apparent quietness. Josh asked Philip if dungeons typically look like this and marveled at how such structures could form naturally. Philip explained that dungeons come in various types, with run-type dungeons like the current one being larger. He described dungeons as formations created by a concentration of mana, allowing their shapes to change and potentially spawn monsters. Philip emphasized the unpredictability of dungeons and urged everyone to stay vigilant. Nakia, observing the environment, was fascinated by the pillars and the magical moss growing on them. She asked if she could collect samples, noting the moss's reputed magical properties. Josh remarked on Nakia's calm demeanor, contrasting it with their nerves. Philip commented that Nakia's composure stemmed from her strength. Raoul, meanwhile, noted the dungeon's unusual aspects. Despite its size and potential rank C growth, the perceived danger level was surprisingly low. He sensed an unnaturally rigid flow of mana, suggesting someone had artificially suppressed the dungeon's magical power. Josh then spotted something on the wall and alerted R. Raoul swiftly turned around as Josh pointed out a magic circle engraved on the dungeon wall. Josh asked if dungeons naturally form such things prompting Nakia to identify it as a magic suppression spell. Raoul wondered why such a spell would be present in this dungeon, sensing something amiss. He immediately warned his knights to be cautious, suspecting a trap. Suddenly, a group of attackers descended upon them with swords drawn, 
forcing the first knights to dodge explosions. Jake voiced confusion over the sudden attack. Meanwhile, Imperial Hounds blocked their path, with their leader acknowledging the unexpected arrival and thanking them for making their infiltration easier. Seeing the Imperial Hounds, Raoul realized they had infiltrated the dungeon and likely suppressed its mana flow. He questioned their motives and swiftly drew his sword from his inventory, preparing to confront them and determined to uncover their plans. The scene shifts and we see Gerald D. Rubin return to the royal palace and encountered his older brother, Herdian D. Rubin, the kingdom's third prince. Herdian reminded Gerald about the order to stay within the palace, questioning why he had ventured outside. Gerald explained that he had to discuss urgent matters with Count Randall regarding the gates, apologizing for not following the order. He acknowledged the necessity of facing the consequences and promised to inform the king himself. Herdian reassured Gerald that there was no need for immediate consequences, expressing confidence that their father, the king, would understand the urgency of the situation. However, he advised Gerald to use messengers or call meetings in the future, emphasizing the king's absolute orders. Gerald respectfully accepted his brother's advice, affirming that he understood and would comply with proper protocol moving forward. As Herdian walked away, he pondered when Gerald had started concerning himself with the gates, wondering if the king or another brother had influenced him. A girl accompanying him clarified that Gerald acted on his own, likely inspired by his classmate Raoul Ashton's achievements. She asked if they should take any action. Herdian instructed her to secretly summon Viscount Plank for a discussion. Meanwhile, inside the dungeon, the Imperial Hound group leader taunted the First Knights, mocking them for falling into the trap and confirming the rumors about Raoul's fascination with Gates. The First Knights, now aware of their opponent's identity, became nervous. Jake angrily called the Imperial Hound's weirdos for hiding in the dungeon, while Philip questioned if they planned to lure the conquest. The leader smugly replied that regardless of their thoughts, the knights had indeed walked into his trap. Raoul felt something was off, questioning why the Imperial Hounds had set a trap with only a few members and no high-ranking personnel. He nervously considered a possibility and turned to Nakia, asking about the effectiveness of the magic circle for mana restriction. Nakia confirmed that it was a powerful high-class restriction spell further enhanced by a dagger artifact in the center. Raoul deduced that the magic circle had restricted the mana within the gate, causing the condensed mana to enhance the gate's rank. Nakia agreed with his assessment. Raoul pondered whether the Imperial Hounds had manipulated the gate's rank to lure them in, and if there was another purpose behind it, given the small number of enemies present. Jake taunted the Imperial Hounds, questioning their confidence in defeating the First Knights. The Imperial Hound group leader retorted, asserting that they were stronger than the kingdom's forces and that their bait had successfully led the First Knights into the trap. Hearing the Imperial Hound leader refer to themselves as bait, Raoul nervously pondered the implications. Jake, Philip, and Josh charged at the Imperial Hounds, with Jake sarcastically hoping they weren't trapped just for a conversation. Philip swiftly defeated two Imperial Hounds, Jake took down another two, and Pierce eliminated two more. Josh defeated the group leader, who dropped to his knees as his sword fell to the ground and admitted he expected defeat but hoped for a better outcome. Philip questioned why the leader had planned such a stupid trap if he anticipated failure. The leader cryptically replied that everything was going according to plan. Meanwhile, Nakia approached the magic circle and noticed another spell cast on the artifact, realizing there was more to the trap. As Nakia recognized the spell cast on the artifact, she started trembling. The Imperial Hound leader declared that they were not weak and that death was part of their plan, proclaiming their success for the Emperor. He then began to tremble and foam at the mouth. At that moment, the magic circle activated. Jake turned to Raoul, asking what was happening, while Raoul looked toward Nakia. Nakia explained that the artifact had a self-destruct spell chain. When the caster died, the restricted mana would be released, causing the condensed mana in the dungeon to go back. A loud noise echoed through the dungeon, causing everyone to turn toward it. Jake asked Raoul about the noise, and Raoul, feeling nervous, sensed something approaching from deep within the dungeon. Soon they saw a large number of armored balls rushing toward them. Philip remarked on the gravity of the situation. Raoul shouted that there were too many balls and ordered everyone to run and escape the gate. 
They followed Raoul as he led them, urging them to run faster toward the gate's entrance, which he indicated was just past a set of stairs. Meanwhile, the gate guardian stood before the dungeon entrance, weapon in hand, blocking their escape route. The scene shifts at Rubbin Kingdom Palace, Herdy and D. Rubbin, the kingdom's third prince, apologize to Viscount Jerry D. Plank for the short notice and the difficulty of entering the palace secretly due to the king's order to restrict entry and exit. He emphasized the necessity of the meeting to prevent their plan from falling apart. Plank, the kingdom's financial director, reassured Herdian that it was his fault for causing concern. Herdian dismissed the formalities and directly asked about the execution of Plank's plan. Plank reminded Herdian of his initial advice about the need for patience to achieve his ambitions. Frustrated, Herdian expressed his unwillingness to wait any longer, having risked everything for the plan. Plank then shared that he was pleased to bring good news, finally delivering results that justified Herdian's patience. Herdian asked Plank what he meant by good news. Plank cryptically replied that Herdian would see the results of patience after tonight. Meanwhile, as Raoul and his team ran towards the exit, Raoul announced that the exit was visible but abruptly stopped as he noticed a monster blocking their path. Jake exclaimed in shock, asking what the monster was, while Philip speculated it might be the gate guardian. Raoul, feeling nervous, wondered why the guardian was in that place. His thoughts were interrupted by a system window displaying an urgent quest. Eliminate the gate guardian. Rank. B. Objective. Eliminate the gate guardian that appeared with the monster wave. Reward. 28,000 experience coins and a random B-rank material box. Raoul continued to think anxiously, lamenting the timing and realizing that if they could reach the valley, they could use the narrow path to escape the gate. He pondered if facing the gate guardian at the dungeon entrance was part of a larger plan, regretting his earlier arrogance. As they heard the approaching footsteps of armored balls from behind, Jake informed the group that they had caught up to them. Philip expressed concern to Raoul, noting that they were likely to be surrounded soon. Raoul, feeling the pressure, considered the elite guardian as a formidable raid monster that couldn't be quickly eliminated. He wondered about his options, realizing that using Regger's power could potentially eradicate both the monsters and the Guardian, but he was unsure about his ability to control it fully, which could endanger his companions. Noticing Raoul's concern, Nakia took action by retrieving something from her pocket and bravely stepping forward to confront the armored balls. This unexpected move puzzled everyone, prompting Josh to inquire about her intentions. Meanwhile, Nakia revealed a bottle of potion and assured Raoul that she would handle the monsters. She then commanded the knights to assist Raoul in clearing a path forward. Raoul, alarmed at Nakia's bold move to confront the approaching armored balls alone, shouted out to her, expressing concern that she couldn't handle them by herself. However, his surprise grew as he noticed the potion she carried. Reacting quickly, Raoul instructed his knights to stay clear of Nakia and prevent the Guardian from reaching her, emphasizing that while it might not be the safest approach, they needed to trust Nakia's judgment. As Nakia began to use the potion, a mixture of potion and mana started to emit from the bottle. The armored boar closed his target on her to attack. Undeterred, Nakia began chanting in a language unfamiliar to the others. Soon, powerful magic began to manifest freezing the armored boar in their tracks. The knights and Raoul were stunned by this display of magic. Raoul realized that Nakia had already attained a remarkable level of skill in a form of magic known as the dragon's tongue. This ancient magic was considered the highest form below that of a god, allowing her to wield draconic magic with incredible proficiency. At the dungeon gate, two soldiers were stationed there. One soldier inquired about the time and expressed frustration over the delay caused by the Randall, a group known for their tardiness. The second soldier, dismissing concerns about the absence of the Randall standby team, implied they were likely just neglecting their duties. When the first soldier questioned why Randall was in charge of the gate, the second soldier noticed them arriving and called out for their tardiness. At that moment, both soldiers were attacked by an individual they assumed was from the Randall but who was actually from the Imperial Hound. Additional members of the Imperial Hound arrived, confirming there were no more witnesses and preparing to initiate chaos by disrupting the gate's control. 
The scene then moves to a prison where Kane is taken aback by the information from a captured member of the Imperial Hound. In disbelief, Ken asked the prisoner to repeat what he had said. The prisoner revealed that the Imperial Hounds had already infiltrated the entire kingdom and that their plan was in motion. When Kane questioned if the recent attacks on the gates and guilds were merely provocations, the prisoner clarified that these actions were not intended to provoke, but were preparations for war. He ominously stated that the war would commence that night, targeting the heart of Reuben. Upon learning the imminent threat from the Imperial Hound, Kane, without delay, disguised himself as Alfredo Grilli and rushed out of the prison cell. The guards, surprised and trying to stop him, were unable to catch up as he fled. Kane's thoughts were filled with dread as he realized that everything had been orchestrated for war and that the Reuben kingdom was on the brink of falling that night. Meanwhile, within the gate, Nakia, using a potion and wielding draconic magic, advanced towards the armored boar. Josh, witnessing the unfolding situation, remarked on the unusual and alarming events. Raul, observing Nakia's formidable power and the tremors shaking the dungeon, speculated that her strength might be enough to defeat the boss in a single blow. Raul, turning his sword to the boss monster, laughed off his attack which he had blocked with his sword. Realizing that the boss monster was targeting Nakia, Raul instructed his team to prevent the monster from disrupting her efforts, urging them to deny the boss any opportunities. As his team prepared to engage the boss monster, Nakia unleashed a draconic magic attack. Her powerful spell decimated all the armored beasts in front of her and created a tunnel through her magic. Her team members were stunned by the sheer magnitude and effectiveness of her attack. Raul, impressed by Nakia's overwhelming power, thought to himself that she had exceeded his expectations by annihilating the wild boar army with a single spell. He noted that the boss monster's attempt to stop her indicated it was threatened by her magic. Exhausted from her powerful spell, Nakia was about to collapse, but Josh caught her, expressing concern for her well-being. Jake remarked on Nakia's solo achievement, and Philip was astonished. Raul instructed Josh to look after Nakia, which Josh confirmed he would do. Raul then praised Nakia for saving them all. As the boss monster charged for another attack, Raul and his team readied themselves in formation. Raul assured her, leave the rest to them, signaling their readiness to confront the boss monster. At the western border of Reuben Kingdom, Dylan, after defeating the last orc, inquired about the situation. The night captain reported that there were no significant threats, with no monsters or wild animals present. Dylan expressed confusion, noting that they had been warned about a massive wave of monsters approaching the border, but had only encountered a few orcs and goblins. He also questioned the location of the Templeton Knights, who were said to be at the northern border. The night captain confirmed that the Templeton Knights had received an urgent order from the Royal Intelligence. Dylan noted that the presence of the Swordmaster and his knights at the northern border suggested the possibility of a significant threat, like a dragon. He expressed a feeling that something was amiss despite the apparent calm. The knight captain agreed that something felt off, explaining that while knights are typically dispatched to handle monsters, it was unusual for elite knight orders to be sent to the borders. This unusual deployment of main forces could leave the capital vulnerable. Although the McNeil and Randall Knights remained in the capital, the situation still posed a potential danger. Dylan pondered the situation and decided they would continue searching until sunrise. He instructed the night captain to form two scout teams, one to inform his father and the other to head to the capital. When the night captain questioned the need to send a team to the capital, Dylan explained that they should secretly investigate the situation due to his uneasy feeling. Meanwhile, inside the gate, the boss monster launched a ranged attack that Raul had blocked with his sword. The boss then commanded his team to launch their attack. Philip and Jake leaped into the air, launching sword attacks at the boss monster, but their strikes were blocked and they were pushed back. Pierce seized the opportunity to slide in and shoot arrows at the boss, only for the boss to catch them, surprising Pierce before kicking him away. The boss then pushed Philip and Jake aside but they quickly repositioned to attack again. However, the boss monster swiftly targeted Jake with a powerful attack, sending him flying back. Philip, concerned for Jake, 
turned to check on him, but was attacked by the boss monster, causing him to fall to the ground. Raul then charged forward and landed a sword attack on the boss, but the injury was minor. In response, the boss monster roared and struck the ground with a powerful hit, creating an explosion that blasted everyone backward due to the force of their pressure. As the dust cleared, Pierce asked Jake if he could move, to which Jake confidently replied that he was fine and that it was nothing. Pierce noted the battle was more challenging than anticipated, with the boss monster's agility, despite its size, making it difficult to handle. He remarked that this monster was likely the strongest they had encountered inside the gates. Meanwhile, Raul checked on Philip's condition and asked if he could continue fighting. Philip confirmed he could and warned Raul that this monster was different from previous guardians they had faced. Raul explained that the monster's increased strength was due to a sudden release of restricted mana, making it technically a rank C guardian. He encouraged his team not to give up, emphasizing that facing stronger opponents presents growth opportunities and that overcoming this monster was part of their path as first knights. Raul gave the order for Jake and Pierce to wait for his signal before attacking, aiming to defeat the monster swiftly. Both Jake and Pierce confirmed their readiness. Philip warned Raul that the monster's quick reflexes made it difficult to find an opening. Raul, confident and eager to utilize a particular strategy, reassured his team. He then instructed the system to activate Radiant Aura, preparing to use this ability to gain an advantage in the fight. When Raul activated Radiant Aura, a pair of golden wings appeared on his back, stunning the boss monster. Philip observed the display of Radiance while Pierce and Jake felt their bodies healing, recognizing it as the skill Raoul had used. Jake reflected on how impressive Raoul was, recalling that this skill was demonstrated during a ceremony. Raoul, acknowledging it was his first time using this skill in combat, expressed his need for his subordinates' assistance. He thanked them for their bravery and dedication, declaring it was the least he could do in return. He urged them to finish the fight, noting they had spent too much time in the gate. As the boss monster charged at Raul, he evaded the attack by jumping into the air and then launched his attack, which the boss monster blocked with its axe. The boss monster quickly pushed Raul back with a fast axe attack. Raul noted the monster's speed, recognizing it as a raid level threat, but resolved to hold it down until it made a mistake. He focused on blocking the monster's attacks. Meanwhile, Josh placed Nakia by a rock to support her as she sat. He asked if she was awake and she confirmed she was. Seeing Raul fighting the boss monster, Nakia grew concerned for him. Jake, noticing that Raul was fighting alone, questioned if they should assist. Pierce reminded Jake of Raul's orders to wait for a signal and emphasized the need to trust their master. As Raul continued to fight the boss monster, he blocked its attacks while thinking he needed just a bit more time. He considered using his psychokinesis on the boss's weapon and applied psychokinesis to the boss monster's weapon, creating intense pressure that forced the monster to the ground. Realizing the threat, the boss monster threw away its axe. Seizing the opportunity, Raul gave the order for everyone to attack. Pierce fired an arrow that struck the boss monster, making it scream in pain. Philip and Jake then rushed in and delivered a powerful combined attack that severely injured the monster. Raul followed up with a final strike, finishing the boss and causing it to collapse. Exhausted, Raul sat down and stored his sword in his inventory, remarking that it had been a close fight. Philip checked on him, asking if he was okay. Raul responded that he was fine, but needed a brief rest. Jake expressed concern that Raul had overexerted himself noting that Raul had even used an area of effect healing skill to aid them. Raul replied that he couldn't have defeated the raid monster alone and emphasized the importance of his team's support. He also mentioned that he felt the need to contribute significantly, especially since Nakia had done so much for them. At that moment, Bernard contacted Raul through the guild platform, asking if he could hear him. Raul recognized Bernard's voice and inquired about the issue. Bernard informed Raoul that there was a problem. The capital and the royal palace were under attack. At the Reuben Kingdom Palace, the scene was grim with soldiers' dead bodies scattered around. The king confronted his son, Herdian D. Reuben, who was threatening him and had killed his brothers. The king asked why Herdian was doing this, questioning his sanity. 
Herdian explained that his actions were for the future of the kingdom. He argued that the king's worsening illness made him unfit to rule and that his brothers were inadequate successors. Herdian believed someone had to take drastic measures to save the kingdom. The king, trembling and sweating, questioned whether Herdian's idea of saving the kingdom involved aligning with the empire. Herdian declared that it was time to end the conflict with the empire and promise peace between the kingdom and the empire under his rule. At that moment, Carson arrived at the palace and launched a surprise attack on the empire's soldiers, killing them before they could react. He then turned his attention to Herdian, but Herdian blocked Carson's attack. Herdian acknowledged Carson, referring to him as the president of the Knights Association. Carson, enraged, shouted at Herdian, calling him a traitor. Herdian remarked that he had been informed that all obstacles in the capital obstructing the revolution had been dealt with implying that Carson was not among those obstacles. Meanwhile, Carson ordered the soldiers to bring the injured king to safety. The soldiers began evacuating the king. Herdian dismissed the effort as futile, stating there was no safe place left in the palace or the capital. Carson countered that while the situation might seem dire now, Herdian would ultimately lose if they could just hold out. Herdian scoffed at the idea of holding out, dismissing the possibility of reinforcements from Templeton or Ashen arriving, claiming they would not come. Carson retorted that Herdian was mistaken and that Templeton and Ashton were already en route as the kingdom's saviors. Meanwhile, at the gate, two imperial hounds were on guard. The first imperial hound questioned why they were stationed there, confident that no one would escape that night. The second imperial hound agreed, believing their plan was flawless. The first hound then expressed curiosity about the situation in the capital, suggesting it was likely more interesting. Raoul emerged from the gate and swiftly attacked the imperial hounds, killing them before they could respond. He realized that the presence of these imperial hounds at the gate indicated Bernard's warning was accurate. If the borders were under such threat, the capital itself was likely in grave danger. He concluded they needed to act quickly. Jack also coming out of the gate, questioned why the Imperial Hounds were present instead of the Randall. Philip speculated that the Randall had been defeated. Pierce disagreed, noting that if the Randall had been taken out, there would be visible signs of it, and the area was too clean. Josh then suggested that the Randall might have fled. Kane arrived at the gate and reassured them that the Randall hadn't fled. They didn't need to. He expressed relief at Raoul's safe return. Raoul inquired about the situation seeking more information. Kane explained that the situation was dire, revealing that the Imperial Hounds, who had been hiding in the capital, had launched an attack. He confirmed that the Randall were leading the Imperial Hounds in the assault on the capital, verifying that the Randall were indeed collaborating with them. The revelation that the Randall were collaborating with the Imperial Hounds shocked everyone. Raoul reflected on the situation, recalling the Revan Kingdom Rebellion a historical incident where key factions within the kingdom conspired with the empire to stage a rebellion and seize the throne, leading to the ruin of Ashton County. He questioned whether his actions had accelerated the empire's plans. Raoul inquired about Bernard and the knights. Kane reported that Bernard and Homer had led their forces out, but it was challenging to approach the palace due to the absence of the kingdom's main forces in the capital. Raoul acknowledged that the Randall's significant role in the rebellion made sense, given the circumstances. Jack, infuriated, demanded that they take action against the rebels, expressing his frustration over their alliance with the Empire. Pierce advised him to remain calm, noting that they were low on stamina and mana and would be ineffective if they rushed in immediately. While they were discussing their next steps, Josh helped Nakia by setting her down nearby and telling her to rest. Nakia thanked him. Meanwhile, Jake was visibly distressed by their depleted stamina and mana, worrying about their ability to continue. Philip asked Nakia if she had any potions remaining. Nakia responded that she did, but they would be ineffective as everyone had already reached their daily dose limit. Taking more could even cause side effects. Kane speculated that the rebels had planned the situation to eliminate any obstacles that could interfere with their plans. Raoul Realizing that he couldn't use Radiant Aura due to their exhaustion and the energy spent in the gate, was concerned about their next steps and what they should do. A system window appeared, 
showing a request from Librarian Ravel to use a Rank D Mana Stone from the inventory, asking Raoul for approval. Raoul was surprised by this and wondered about its significance. At that moment, a book materialized in front of him. Ravel emerged from the book and greeted Raoul, acknowledging that he seemed to be in trouble and noting that it had been a while since they last met. Raoul, recognizing her, responded with surprise and asked how she was. In the capital, soldiers' lifeless bodies were scattered on the ground as one person worked to save a woman and her child from the Imperial Hounds. One Imperial Hound member, surprised to see someone still resisting, asked if the person's knighthood affiliation was known. Another member dismissed the inquiry, suggesting they should simply eliminate him. The third member revealed that the person had been part of Carrington County's Nobility's Guard, but had quit after the gate incident. He remarked that if the person had stayed, he could have been part of the ongoing revolution. Marco, reflecting on the situation, questioned whether Carrington was involved in the rebellion and collaborating with the Empire. With Templeton and Ashton at the border and McNeil and Greer's whereabouts unknown, he feared that the only force left to oppose the rebellion were the guards. Contemplating whether this was the end, the Imperial Hound member threatened the person, assuming he would have rejected any offer to join the rebellion and promising a quick end. At that moment, Dalton arrived from behind and confronted the Imperial Hounds, questioning their audacity. He then swiftly defeated all the Imperial Hound members with a single, efficient sword attack before they could react. Dalton's swift defeat of the Imperial Hounds astonished everyone. Dalton expressed regret for killing all the Hounds, wishing he had spared one for interrogation. Turning to Marco, Dalton recognized him as a knight from Carrington and asked if he was indeed Marco. Marco confirmed his identity and expressed surprise that Dalton was still in the capital, given that he thought the Templeton Knights were stationed at the northern border. Dalton explained that he had sneaked out of the northern border, noting how difficult it had been to avoid detection and expressing surprise at the turn of events in the capital. Marco agreed with Dalton's assessment. The woman expressed her gratitude to Marco for saving them. Marco redirected her thanks to Dalton, indicating that Dalton was the one who had truly helped. The woman's child asked if the Templeton knighthood would protect them. Marco, feeling anxious, did not respond. Dalton, however, explained that the Templeton Knights could not protect as they were far from the capital. He reassured them by mentioning that Raoul, the guardian of Turium, was present, implying that he would provide the necessary protection. Meanwhile, at the gate, Ravel greeted Raoul, questioning whether he had forgotten about her. Raoul responded by asking if Ravel was now okay. Ravel assured Raoul that she was fine, her mana overflowing due to his earlier assistance, and expressed her gratitude. Raoul expressed his relief and happiness that she had recovered and was feeling better. Ravel, noticing how tired everyone was and recognizing their predicament, requested to borrow the mana stone to help them. Jake, puzzled by his conversation with seemingly no one, asked if Raoul was okay. Raoul realized that Jake couldn't see Ravel but chose not to explain. Instead, he turned back to Ravel and asked if she could help them with their current situation. Ravel confirmed that Raoul could trust her. Josh, confused by his use of the guild comm and who he was talking to, voiced his concerns. Nakia noticed Ravel and speculated that Raoul might be communicating with someone important, suggesting they wait and let him sort things out. Jake agreed to wait. Ravel explained to Raoul that she could use the Mana Stone to temporarily heal everyone with her spirit spell, which would bypass their potion immunity. She clarified that temporarily meant she would forcefully increase their maximum stamina, emphasizing the need to finish their mission before sunrise. Raoul asked Ravel if she could indeed use the Mana Stone to help them. He then addressed his party members, stressing the urgency due to the capital's dire situation. He acknowledged their exhaustion but assured them he had a way to boost everyone's stamina. Raoul promised to explain further later, but warned that the upcoming fight would be different and that their safety couldn't be guaranteed. He asked if they were still willing to fight with him. All party members, despite their fatigue, agreed enthusiastically. Meanwhile, in the capital, guards were engaged in combat with the Imperial Hounds. One guard urged another not to retreat, emphasizing the need to protect the civilians behind them and to hold the line. 
One Imperial Hound member questioned the recklessness of their enemies, wondering why they were fighting so hard when their fate seemed doomed. Another hound commented that there was no one left to assist them, asserting that the kingdom was already under the Empire's control. Meanwhile, Raoul used his psychokinesis to attack the Imperial Hounds from behind with multiple swords. This unexpected intervention surprised the guards. Raoul then rallied the defenders by shouting, Awaken your dormant bravery, warriors of the Rubin Kingdom. The first knight is here.